Good afternoon, everybody. It's Monday, August 9th, 2021. My name is Mike Lankford, and welcome back to another episode of Dear Bands Live, the podcast that explores the paths and stories of career-minded artists and music industry professionals. My guest today, to say the least, comes from a musical family as a performer, recording artist, and touring musician. Touring and recording credits include bands and artists such as Crash Test Dummies, Amanda Marshall, Matthew Good, Ron Hawkins, and the Do Good Assassins, and Ashley McIsaac. He's also branched out as a songwriter and producer, releasing original music with his band, The Heartbroken. Canadian singer-songwriter Rex Gowdy put it best, literally a few hours ago. One of the best people I've had the pleasure of touring with, Stuart is an absolute gentleman and a monster guitarist. Please welcome our guest today, guitarist, producer, songwriter, Stuart Cameron. Stuart, how's it going? Good, man. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. It's been a while. That has been. Thanks for the beautiful. That was a nice intro. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, you're well. It's it's my second favorite part of the show, as I say. It is. <laughs> and that was sweet of Rex Gowdy. I thought it was amazing. I was right. I was writing the intro for it, and then you put that on on the post. I was like, you know what? I couldn't find the words oh, better. Oh, that's sweet. It's well, perfect. I mean, let's talk about like you and I have known each other for a long time, and we haven't seen each other for a very very long time. And Rex Gowdy is even one of those guys. Like I can't tell you the last time I saw Rex. So uh, maybe he could. Maybe he'll he'll comment or something. It's fond memories. Yeah, exactly. I love that guy. I'm I'm sure we'll we'll get there with some of the the tour stuff. Maybe we'll we'll make a note of that. Um, how how's it? You just you said it's been a while since we've seen each other. How have you been? Great. Um, left Toronto, and we moved out to the Burbs. <laughs> Uh, last, started it great left toronto we left toronto <laughs> like a lot of, like well like a lot of people did listen i, I love toronto um uh, as i always have and but we just uh you know we were living in a in a loft where um you know we had 940 square feet of of just the two of us and looking at, and our dog and um <laughs> so it was a, it was a we had a chance and opportunity when COVID hit and uh to move out to the burbs so we moved up to Pickering and love it. We love it. So now we, you know, I have my little room here and uh, a yard and and uh, garden. We like gardening. Never knew. <laughs> Until you could have a guard. You never yeah. knew you liked gardening. Yeah. I, I want to ask, because I know there's a, like, actually, this, this brings up a, a point off the top. Um, people that are afraid to leave larger cities as musicians. Mm -hmm. And the idea, like, when you made that choice, was it like, I hope this works? Or like, no, this is the right move? Well, I found that um, I, I, I was recording a lot at home as it, as it was. Uh, if I was touring, I was I was leaving the city. I was I was you know going on getting on the road, um, and things that I was doing within the city that would be like with Ron Hawkins and the Do Good Assassins. It would be like down at the Dakota from seven to nine. So I was like home having a glass of wine by ten, <laughs> and you know things like that were. It, it, it did make it easy. It wasn't, it was hard to leave friends and, you, you know, I, um, I'd love to go and like, I, I miss my buddies and sitting on a, on a patio having a pint, but, um, you know, it's not that bad. We have a go train. I can get right down there. It's quick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not, I, I, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a massive decision. It was, it was just, it felt clear when, when, when we made it. Now there's a lot of conveniences living downtown or living within a larger city, but, mm -hmm. but like the the uh, what's the word I'm looking for the bonuses of having the extra space around you you know and just the that extra little bit of travel time to get into for the gigs and whatever it's like it it's pretty Look, it's pretty obvious when you show up when you're on the road and you get out you know um you get to whatever airport and then you have to drive for four and a half hours somewhere it's like that's a pain but um, <laughs> especially if you're driving you know like if you're traveling all day and but this is, you know, this is 35 minutes down the road. It's not. It's not it's, far. It's, it's not far. It's not not like, you know, like I said, if, if I was down at the Dakota, sometimes it would take me 25, 30 minutes to drive from from St. Clair and, and Caledonia. Which so, is not far. It's not far. So it's <laughs> kinda, I can make it quicker to. A, uh, uh, and I can't wait to go to a base to a Jays game again. But, um, yeah, I can get down to uh, the Rogers Center easier than I could when I was up on stage. So yeah, there are, 
Those are the advantages so far. <laughs> Not that I've left to go anywhere, though, so I don't really know. That's true as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you touched on it, the idea of being able to do some recording at home and be able to work at home, like having yeah. that extra bit of space there. And that, that's been the biggest boom uh, for a lot of musicians the last year and a half is just how do I record at home? Yeah. And and um, thankfully, before um, before everything stopped, I guess uh, my last gig was March 12, 2020. Um, and that January prior, um, I bought one of those universal Xboxes. boxes yeah and thank god i did because it you know <laughs> like at first i was looking at it going okay i can't wait to use this at home and i used it on the road and didn't have a lot of time with it at home now that i have i mean it was the that really that really did change a lot of uh a lot of a lot of things for me and and, and how how I went about recording while we're on that topic, so I don't forget to, because we, we have a bit of history working in studio, um, yeah. you, you producing records, uh, and, and my work on the, the, uh, the recording side of it, recording you on some of those projects, and again, Rex said monster guitar player, I still think that's an understatement, because watching you play acoustic guitar and how you, how you make it sing, how you make it work, but you as a musician producing and playing and telling me, no, do that again, or yeah, I think we got it, one of the issues I've had in my end the last year and a half is musicians not knowing how to kind of police themselves or produce mm -hmm. themselves and knowing when something is good enough or falling into the opposite trap of thinking everything needs to be perfect all the time. So I can yeah. imagine how much, of it, that, how much of an advantage it is for you knowing how to actually track yourself and objectively look at your performances and go, yeah, this is good or I can do that again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> luckily, um, I have a production team um, uh along with Peter Fusco, with Pico. Remember Peter Fusco? <laughs> yeah. Incredible musician, bass player, writer, producer. Um, I'll, sit, I'll sit up here and record until, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning sometimes and <laughs> send him all of these files of just different ideas. Let's say we're working on one song, and I send him different ideas. So I'm lucky that uh, he'll edit me. <laughs> and but it's unfortunate for him where Pico has to go through you know all of these things and say this is crap this is oh, that's good that'll work I can fix that you know things like that because yeah. I will sit there and I, I think that you know it is um, it is hard to sit there and let something go because once it's out there like you know if yeah. there's something that you don't like about it you will hear that for the rest of your life. Every time you hear that song or recording, you're like, ah, <laughs> I could have done that better, right? So sometimes it's um, uh, either artists that we're working with and or Pico reassuring me that, don't worry, it's fine. So I, I actually do have a problem with, with letting stuff go, but fortunately I have an editor and that will that will steer me i trust him and that that's, that's what important it's about. that's that's the that's the biggest one is is uh is trusting the person that that you know that you're working with and uh if that band or artist has they have to have trust in you and vice versa like it's a two-way street and uh yeah so i mean i have a hard time letting things go <laughs> <laughs> well from my experience i thought you did a really good job of deciding what oh. what was the keeper and well, what that, we should do again. Maybe I'm getting worse. I should go back to those <laughs> days. No, it's good, though, to have a second set of ears to bounce stuff off. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that that yeah. is good. But I just, I've seen musicians fall in that trap of yeah. just like, strive for that that perfect take. And like, you know what? The thing is just chop two together, and it's probably going to be pretty good. And that's there are also, what we do. There are also things where, um, you know, where you were talking about acoustic guitar. So if I'm kind of playing loosey-goosey acoustic guitar... And then I'm up here at two o'clock in the morning playing loosey goosey electric guitar over top of it. Um, it might, you know, the, the 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 feel and all of it might might feel great. And then you listen to it the next day, and you're like, oh my god, that's so. <laughs> they're not matching. And then, uh, th and this happened recently. It was like, no, it actually, it's it's cool. Like, think of it doesn't need to be perfect all the time. And and so, you know, I'm getting better at letting things go. And we can definitely get get way into that. And, yeah. I, and, I, and that's funny because like when you talk about the idea of tracking something at two o'clock in the morning, yeah, inspirado and ideas can definitely start to get a little bit sideways sometimes after midnight. Oh, yeah. You know? it, like 11 a.m. ideas 
And yeah. I think we just joked no, we just joked um, no rock before uh, or, uh, before noon. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea, like what you're doing in in the morning, or early afternoon, versus what you're doing maybe ten or twelve hours into your day, can vary quite a bit. Oh, it, it usually starts with acoustic guitar. <laughs> right. It's uh, it's usually it's it's usually okay. Get this, get the nail this, and then. Uh, that's how I look at it. Like the electric guitar just could be so much fun and getting different sounds. And I, I have a big, it's kind of a ridiculous pedal board, but I got <laughs> so tired of leaning down and grabbing different pedals and trying different combinations and all that stuff. And, um, you know, which can be like painting a picture, what colors to, to choose. And But I got sick and tired of bending over, so I put my pedal board on top of a, like this swiveling table it's just kind of ridiculous, but it, it but it, <laughs> but it, but it works now. You know, like I can swap out different effects and things like that. And yeah, no, it it works. You got to find what works in your your setup there. And and again, I want to give you a, a admiring your setup there. See some some uh, records, some awards on the wall. See your Vox amp sitting up there beside you. That's it's, my old AC15 that you remember there. Yeah. And it's good to just have that space that you can just be inspired and just get to work. Yeah. And I do encourage musicians, like, be at a little uh, spot in your apartment, your house, whatever. It's like carve out some space that you can just get to work. Well, eventually, I'd like to have all of this in in the basement. And um, but like, the, what I have on the walls here is uh, their U-Haul moving blankets. Like <laughs> that works. And it and. And I said, well, I just just want to I want to figure out, you know, what kind of treatment I want to have in the in the room before, uh, you know, it's a big expense. Yes. So yeah. I was like, well, U-Haul blankets kind of do the same thing. And I've been carting these U-Haul blankets around for ten years or something from <laughs> apartment to apartment to house to house. So uh, now I'm using U-Haul blankets. So it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> look like much, but the room is very dead. Um, and yeah, it, it works like, and, and that's the thing you can, like you just said, you can turn any little space into, you know, anything you want and call it a studio. Yeah. Just, just build it. That's my thing. So we've exactly. got to get the laptop set up and plug things in. Uh, one of the, uh, the pieces of advice that a friend was learning to play uh, acoustic guitar and, um, when she was being sold on the guitar, it's like the, the salesman person was saying you should buy a stand. And she's like, well, I'll just put it back in the case. And it's like, no, because if you have it on the stand, you'll pick it up. If it's in the case, you've got to open the case. There's that barrier to entry that's always there. So, yeah. again, with us creating and recording and stuff, I encourage people just to have it set up so you can just hit record almost. Yeah. Just get to work. So Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's great advice. So many things like that. So many things like that. Mm -hmm. Not say just hobbies, but just in general. Just when, mm -hmm. especially if you're being creative, it's like you know, if you want to paint, just keep the keep the easel up and keep mm -hmm. the paints out, mm -hmm. uh, not so they dry out, but just mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Keep mm -hmm. stuff that's ready to go. Um, I don't even know where to start with you as a musician getting started, because for those who don't know, you come from a musical family. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to start there as far as your your upbringing and yeah, I mean, what was um, normal? Um, what well, was normal to me, um, my dad, um, his name was John Allen Cameron and, uh, he passed away. It'll be, it'll be 15 years this November, um, since he, since he, since he passed away, but I started with him. So he was a, a singer, entertainer, guitar player, fiddle player, had his own television show for years, um, and toured relentlessly, um, it was nothing for me, you know, as a kid, uh, or for nothing for him to go away for a few months at a time, and that just felt normal to me, you know. And it, but it was it, it was different. And his thing was always not the quantity of time spent together, the quality of time. So uh, we had a lot of great a lot of great time together. But the greatest time that I had with him was when the two of us were on the road together. Excuse me, when the two of us were on the road together, um, you know, we'd be in in, in his van for hours and just talk and listen to music and then play shows together. And he really taught me um, the ropes on how to treat people in a recording studio, how to treat people at a, at a, at a venue, um, you know, to be good, to be good to one another. And, and um, that was a big part of, of what he carried with him 
everywhere he performs. So, and he enjoyed it. Um, and I try to remind myself to enjoy it as much as I can, like he did. But um, but having those, having having that experience um, as a kid, like I, I think I started touring with them just before I was 16. And uh, then I could do half the driving as well. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it, I mean, we, we toured together for, for a very, very long time. And, and he, for his contribution to Canadian culture and everything, uh, he actually received the Order of Canada at one point. Because um, he, basically, they credit him and they regard him as being the godfather of Celtic music of Canada. That's a pretty big title to, to have. And this was pre Ashley McIsaac or Natalie McMaster, or the Bear McNeils and the Rankins or anything like that. Um, which were all out of Cape Breton Island as well. So <laughs> he was basically the first person to leave Cape Breton and uh, perform that music um, around the world. Uh, and like, there, okay, there's a great story. 1967, he. Um, was playing, he was offered to play the Grand Ole Opry. And there was somebody, and I can't remember who, who it was, but he was wearing this white sequence suit with um, red lips, sequence lips all over it. And my dad looked at that and went, if that guy's getting on stage and wearing a white sequence suit with red lips all over it, I'm wearing my kilt. So he, he put on his kilt, and somebody walked up to him before they played, and they said, where are y'all from, Mars? And, like, they'd never seen it. <laughs> a guy in a kilt before, and he went up there, and they had 12 minutes to perform, okay? And it was David Eisner and, um, oh my God, uh, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Wrote, anyway, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, um, he, he was allowed 12, they were allotted 12 minutes to perform. And the host walked up to him and said, kid, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. He said, sir, I only have... 12 minutes he said my show keep going and it was on radio then so he they did like a a, a full like 20 minutes or something uh, but there he was standing on the grand Ole opry stage in a kilt um playing playing a 12 string martin playing bagpipe tunes on the guitar and people they've never heard music like that before so he always liked being a little bit left to center right and and that night, actually, they slept in a in a baseball field. Like they did, they, they didn't have enough <laughs> money to to um, to pay for a hotel or motel. And but you know, he, like I said, he he always liked to be a little bit of left of center. And I've always been attracted to uh, bands and performers and artists that are a little left of center as well. Not like everything else, you know. Showing up at festivals when you sound like everybody else. You're not gonna, you're not gonna stand out at all. If you sound completely different than everybody else, the people are either gonna love you or hate you. Uh, but they'll remember you, and um, I think that's an important lesson. You know, like it, I, I try and keep that in the back of my head. But because of the bands and things that I played with, they're they're they haven't always been, you know, middle of the road or it's always been a little odd which I'm realizing after 25, 30 years. <laughs> but even even just bringing that up, because I agree 100%, like in a good way, be polarizing. People either love it or they don't love it. And a lot of singers fall into that as well, because it's so easy to turn the radio on and singers all can kind of sound the same. And there's one that sounds unique. There's no one that sounds unique. And people are yeah. like, oh, I love that, or I, or I don't like that at all. Mm -hmm. Leave them with an opinion of it. Because there's lots of bands and musicians where there's just there's just no opinion. It just kind of, it just kind of goes. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like exactly. you know water and river. It just kind of goes, and you're like okay, whatever, sort of yeah. thing. But but looking at it, you're pointing at now, looking at your body of work and bands and artists that you've um, that you've worked with, it's like I can pick out all those vocalists, um, yeah, they're, right they're, off the yeah. top, and people yeah. either they get it or they don't. And I think yeah. that's a big thing about longevity with musicians. Yeah, I, it it. I mean, from all of that experience with my dad um, and playing Celtic music and spending all of that time in Cape Breton uh, as a kid, I was immersed around that, that Cape Breton fiddle music and song and, and, and loved it. Like, um, after high school, I was going to 
go to St. Avex, uh, St. Francis Xavier University in Anaganish, Nova Scotia to study jazz for four years. And I didn't even listen to jazz. I had no idea what jazz was. And nice intro music, by the way. Thank Great. you. Great. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I didn't know what it was. So I, I uh, two weeks before I was going to go, I told my parents and said, I, 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 I don't want, and I lived in Markham at the time, in Markham, Ontario. And I said, Mom, Dad, I don't want to go. I, I really don't. And they, um, I'm, I'm sure they were disappointed, but they were supportive. And they said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to move to Cape Breton. I want to, I love it there. And, and that's what I did. So I worked at a store called um, Radio Land and sold cassettes and CDs to, you know, wearing a tie. Um, <laughs> I had to wear a tie and like sell Metallica records to some kid, you know, like it was, I, but that lasted for about six months because um, within a month and a half of moving to Cape Breton, I was 18 or 19 years old, started um, this band called Green Eggs and Jam with myself, Angelo Juan Carlos Venezuela, Dave Mahalik and Gordy Sampson. So um, we would play you know, two three times a week. And then even Gordy and I would do Saturday and Sunday afternoon duo shows. Um, and I thought I'm making twice as much money as I'm making from radio land. So I, I quit. And <laughs> that was, that was the, that was the kind of beginning of, of, you know, my last real job, but hadn't I moved to Cape Breton and met all those guys, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I would have studied jazz for four years and I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm glad that that, I knew at a very, very young age that I, I needed to go down there and that really did shape the rest of my life. It's, it's funny. Well, it's funny to hear that you were almost going to go to school to study jazz. And I'm only saying that not because I know you. I'm saying that because you're like, wait a second. I don't listen to jazz because you yeah. would have been in there with people that with other other students that probably listen to a lot of jazz. Oh yeah. And you're like, I don't, I don't listen to jazz. No, my wife, and I, <laughs> my wife and I just honestly like we, when we're when we cook together and stuff, we listen to jazz. We have jazz on all the time now. It's great for cooking. Yeah, it's, it's great, great background music. It's great. We out in the yard and the carport, all of it. Like yard like, jazz, we, great. We're we're jazzing it up. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'd love to go study jazz now for four years to figure out um, uh, uh, what the hell I'm listening to. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I bring that up because, and it's hard for some, especially with some parents to understand the kids when, when they, they say, I don't need to go to school for this. And I agree, but you need to learn somewhere. And like, you need to be around like-minded people. And the idea yeah. where like you were thinking maybe school's not that like, Formal education is not the thing, but when you got to Cape Breton and you start working with other people and start actually getting, you know, feet in the fire and like get working, you yeah. learn so much. Oh, quickly. Because you can imagine, I mean, especially musicians that go to school and then the real world punches them in the mouth about how yeah. hard this is going to be. But you've already had that experience and learned at the same time the real world. So, well, they don't, and that's the thing. And, and I mean, we could talk about the whole education system of people not being taught the right things and told about. We were another. That's another taxes. podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but it's true. I and and I and I don't know if they do this, and they may do this now, but I don't know if they talk about the amount of hours it takes uh, to get to one show, or days, you know, or jet lag, or um, shitty food, and um, like you know, just being away from your things and your family and your dog and oh, all of those things. I don't think that they teach any of those things. The only way that you can learn that stuff is to boom, get out there. And, um, I, and I, and I think being in a, in the, in a van or in a car with a band, um, for hours at a time where you go through snowstorms and rainstorms and poor weather just to make it to a gig where there's only going to be seven people there and you're making 150 bucks yeah all, all of you um you know you need to do those things you you can't you can't like i remember it was a band um somebody was asking for a reference of a bus company this is a long time ago i'm like i don't think you should put them on a bus i think they should be in a in a van for the first four or five months or something and 
within two months the drummer had left and the bass player left after that and I was like no you get too comfortable you have to you become a gang yeah you got to go through the hardships yep. everything everything's awesome when things are good when things start to go a little bit sideways because music in in general it's it's all you know it's peaks and valleys you yep. know it's like things are awesome things are not good and like that's and i agree with you 100 it's like those close quarters those oh. um you know one hotel rooms if you get that it's like you learn so much and when you you create that bond when when stuff really hits the fan and you're together through all that yeah you can really enjoy the good times oh well there, there's a um when i was on the road with ashley mcisaac for seven and a half years Jeez. um uh i for about five of those years I shared a room with um, Dave Mann. His name is well, we call him Boris. <laughs> He's a and we're still in contact. Like we still, like we we became brothers during that, you know. And 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 we 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 still contact each other every few weeks um, just to check in and say hello. And that that was like you know that was back in the '90s. But he lives in Vegas and and. Um, you know, it's just yeah. You you do create those those bonds with, and not just you know, not just with the band, but with the crew as well. Like, there, when when you have when you have a great bunch of uh, uh, people working with you, it just makes the world of difference. You you put one little sour sour puss and <laughs> just throw the whole thing off. You know. No, I I hear, and that that could. I'm thinking about doing like a. Uh, a panel talking about like some of the do's and don'ts about touring and a big yeah. part of it is it really gets down to chemistry. It really gets down to the, having the right people together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things too, uh, you, you touched on earlier, um, it weeds people out, you know, being in the van, like how bad do you want to do this? Because things can get way worse, 100%. way worse than a flat tire. You know, if you're blaming someone over, over vehicle problems sort mm -hmm. of thing, of course there's always, there's always, um, you know, uh, story's going to go a bit deeper than that, but um, for the most part, it's like there's lots of things that can go wrong in the music industry. We, the best people are trying to plan stuff, and that you're laughing right now. It's like that's all you can do sometimes because yeah. something can be nice. You can be sitting on a plane ready to take off for a tour. All of a sudden, the plane's not going anywhere, and you get an email saying it's canceled, and you're like, "Well, it's yeah. not surprising." Yeah, you know, it can happen. Yeah, it does happen. <laughs> It does happen, and, and I and and it it really is important to. I, I mean, having a having when you can afford to, because not everybody can afford to go out and have a crew, you know. Um, but it does start at the core. So if that band and or artist uh, creates that that kind of family environment and um, making sure that everybody is is okay and happy and nobody's left out, you know, like that that kind of thing happens all the time where one person gets all the attention or one person is sucking up to the road manager and things like that. But you, you know, when you have, when you have a team leader out there, um, encouraging everybody and, um, just making sure that everyone's all right. You know, like there are some great road managers out there that will pull you in and sit you down and have a real talk with you. Like, you know, if, 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 you might be messing up and and they let you know about it and it's like okay you make that adjustment and if there if that person isn't there to 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 tell you yeah you know and and that could be a leader of a band a road manager it could be could even be the drummer sorry mike that was never the drummer <laughs> usually the drummer yeah 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 so yeah but i i mean but but that's why we do it and with this with this since COVID started, um, you know, being off the road since March 12th, 2020, this is the longest I've ever been home in my life. And it's kind of nice. Like my neighbor said to me, <laughs> it's, I'm being honest. Like, no, they've said, heard you this. Must miss the road. This. It's like, yeah. no, I don't miss the road at all. I miss performing. I miss my, yes. my bandmates and my friends, but I don't, I don't miss sitting in airports. I don't miss going through customs. My, neighbor said to me a few weeks ago you're a real outdoorsy fella aren't you and i said no i'm not because he would see pauline and i out there in the garden working in the garden every single day and 
I've never been able to do anything like that because, you know, I've either been gone away or, or not interested. <laughs> no, if you're you're a musician, like, and you're especially you're touring, like, you're you're lucky if you can keep a cactus alive long enough. Oh yeah, you know, it's just it's almost impossible for some of those yeah. around the house things. And just on the topic too, it's like, um, you know, there's that varying degrees of depression, that post tour depression that sits in. Yep. When you get home and like you're so used to having that that elevated senses the entire time you're touring because like you need to you need to survive all the time when you're touring, yeah. no matter how comfortable you are. There's always stuff you need to survive. And yeah. um, the idea you get home and it's like that stops and the people you're around almost 24 seven that stops. Yeah. And then you're like new home personal life. And like I, I have a fridge and like trying to figure stuff out. And it's like musicians that have been non-stop they're they as you're saying it's like they're realizing like there's comforts at home and well, they're, it's they're, nice there are comforts at home but then there's also like your alcohol intake goes up when you come off the road for some if you're some if you're a drinker things like that you stay up later because you're you wake up at 11 o'clock because that's when the show is usually over and whoever's in your home life is like i'm going to bed you're like i'm wide awake you know? <laughs> do something and, <laughs> such movie <laughs> What do, you, what do you mean? This is, it's time to open up a bottle of wine. And, um, but that's kind of happens. But the other thing that happens is the, the whole group uh, chat text thing where that usually lasts for about two, two and a half weeks after a tour. You know, just where memories come up or uh, a joke that, you know, playing on whatever a riffing on somebody um because you need that kind of communication like you need to keep it going so i i miss i really do miss that part of it and and luckily with uh like with crash test dummies um you know since we've been off the road everyone has still still been in contact and um brad is becoming a virtuoso on the piano and tells us about it all the time it's like that's awesome like <laughs> it's great yeah. um there's there's a lot to unpack in the first story um you're talking about you're, you're no because it's, it's hard sometimes i got my notes and i got what yeah. we we're talking about um but i, I do want to go back because not everyone has the the um opportunity especially if they got a musical family to perform you know with the parent mm -hmm. and in you growing up playing um you know playing guitar and being exposed to it I'm curious how it came to be. Did you ask, can I join your band? Or is dad like, hey, Stuart, do you want to come out on the road? Do you want to play? Like, how, did, how did that actually happen? Um, I always knew that I wanted to. I always knew I wanted to, 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 well, essentially be like my dad. And um, <laughs> actually, this is how it happened as well. When I was, <laughs> I started playing guitar probably when I was around uh seven or eight years old but when i was around six my mother um brought me into clogging lessons which is like step dancing and and uh from the appalachian mountains and um started doing that and i was a part of the ontario rhythm cloggers as a kid and then started doing i don't know if you know any of this i don't know any of this okay. this never this never came up this never came up. Maybe because it's at the so, studio. I'm comfortable. I'm old enough now. I can talk about it. I'm comfortable with it now. I now I love it. You know. And I think there was a point in my life where I was like, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. But I used I to. I can't run for office. I, <laughs> <laughs> I this exactly. I can't, don't let them know about the clogging. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, and my mother. My mother's been teaching clogging for like 40 years now, or something. Like she, her youngest student is three years old and her oldest is 97 or something. It's, a, it's That's amazing. awesome. Like so many, lots brings a lot of people joy, right? But uh, when I started doing it around between the ages of seven and 11, I did the, uh, the Tommy Hunter show. And I don't know if you remember the Tommy Hunter show, but it was a CBC show. Tommy was a country artist and he would have on like, uh, like every, everybody, like Vince Gill's first national appearance in Canada, things like that. Um, Conway Twitty and all of these, big massive country stars would do this cbc show in canada and i think the show was like one of the longest running variety shows in canadian history so i used to do that and it was on on sunday nights which i was reminded of just the other day and uh 
but you know, so it would air, and I, I would get checks in the mail that were like, "Woo! I bought bunk beds, I bought shag <laughs> carpet, I bought a guitar." Like I was, I was making good money when I was between the ages of seven and eleven, and but but kids can be cruel, right? So I would show up. I'd be on television on a Sunday night as a kid, and then I'd show up at school on Monday, and Steve Talenti and Joe DeRosa would kick my ass for you know kids can be mean name so, and names oh damn right i'll never forget them <laughs> but um i hope i was allowed to do that i just needed to but you know <laughs> we're old enough yeah why not but um but that was my first experience in 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 really in performing so i would do this on the tommy hunter show i'll send you some footage it's it's, it's embarrassing so <laughs> Um, from that, then I would go sometimes on the road with my dad, like in the summer, and he would bring me out on stage, and I'd get up there and start dancing. I'd sing a song with them, and and then I'd I'd split. But yeah, it, that when I turned fifteen or sixteen, that's when I he he just asked me. I remember him actually leaving uh, a cassette for me. I came home from school, and he left a cassette uh, of of basically set notes. So I'm going to be playing this, so maybe you can play something like this. And so I worked on that for about two weeks, and then came showtime, excuse me, then came whenever the, whenever the show or gig was, we would, uh, you know, I, I just started playing with them. So I think I was around 15. So it's kind of kind of seamless transition, because it sounds like it was always kind of, as the seeds are already planted in a way as far as you performing. Yeah. Yeah, and I enjoyed it. I loved being on a stage. I loved, um, I loved looking at all you know, sound boards and and uh, lights and cameras and all those things. It was exciting, you know, for a kid. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate that my that my uh, both my parents were incredibly supportive of, of kind of anything I wanted to do, really. And and but they they did push me a little, um, but never in a way where I like if I didn't like it like I remember when I stopped dancing stopped clogging that was like the biggest decision of my life and I was 11 years old or 12 and um I just I wanted to I had I had posters of Eddie Van Halen on the wall you know like that's 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 who I wanted to be and um and that's when I bought a metallic pearl pink Ibanez Proline series that I still have you still have oh yeah it's ugly (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, um, and then went from there. No, I just I, I think it's it's amazing because I think I can't relate to it, but I imagine what it would be like for a parent, the child kind of following in their footsteps as far as our, a career choice in music. Because mm-hmm. um, I've heard you know the opposite. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Not personally, but just from other people. Are you sure you want to do this? Because it's like not easy sort of thing. But, you know, when you see a path there, when kids are like already intru- in, interested in it and already kind of making, making, uh, I'm trying, trying to not have more clogging puns here, but making more steps towards being in, in music. Um, but yeah, no, it's just having, having supportive parents. It's, it's so huge for, yep. for so many musicians. Cause the, the other thing too, is you got to go the opposite direction where you need to kind of like show them, you know, like I'll yeah. show my parents that I can do this sort of thing. And I think that strains a relationship so much. Just like let people try stuff. Let yeah. people yeah. figure out what they want to do. You decided you didn't want to do jazz. And that's okay. Things yeah. worked out. You can always go back to it later. No, I no, I don't think so. <laughs> but um no, it's true. And and, and yeah, I, I like I owe my parents I owe my parents everything for that. I really, really do. Yeah. Okay, I, I wanted to go back to that for a second because I just the time can just melt by so quickly, and I just I was curious um, what the transition was like for that. Um, so you go to Cape Breton, um, you got a, you got the what is it, uh, Green Eggs and Jam going yep. there. That was your first serious project, you'd say. Serious? I don't know if we were serious. I mean, we would play a bunch of covers uh, and have like the best time ever, and we would play sometimes twice at this club called the Capri Club um, in Sydney in Cape Breton. And sometimes twice a week. And um, it was just like a party. And I found out just a few years ago that everybody that sat on the, on the right side of the stage, half of them were on acid the whole time. They would <laughs> and I had no idea. Was, yeah. But everybody's like, oh, we were all on acid back then. It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like this. Um, 
it was a party atmosphere and uh it was a lot it was a lot of fun it was just a like and but those were you know that's that's where you put in the hours of of just being on stage and and it was all acoustic as well there was like one electric bass but like three acoustic guitars just slamming and and um it was just fun you know and uh but after right after that and even during the end of that uh, i joined a band called sunfish and uh that was a lot of fun that lasted for not too long um because i got the offer to go out on the road with ashley mcisaac that he started doing something and and i would play little you know duo one-off gigs with him every now and then but um wayne o'connor and sherry jones they came to uh, see my dad and i in halifax um and then pulled me aside and said look uh, since you're living down here now, we want to put, put a band together with Ashley, um, with Ashley McIsaac, and would you be interested? We want to put like a rock band behind him. So that's how that started. And so I had to, again, made that make that painful decision as to leave. Green Eggs and Jam was kind of done at that point. People were going off to university and so on um, to start their lives. And... You know, it was a tough decision with that, like I said, with the Sunfish thing. But then, you know, um, the Ashley thing took off like, like wildfire. Like that. That's that's when it got nuts. Was it already moving at that point, or was there something kind of bubbling and like this could take off? And there was, there was something bubbling, like um, especially in the Maritimes, because ashley at that point had gone off to new york with philip glass to work on on um on something with him and then ended up playing carnegie hall with paul simon and you know like his his star was 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 rising quickly and but we didn't have a record so he had one solo record at that point um, and he was already known as a, like a, a, a prodigy as a, as a kid like he's he's so you've, incredibly you've said that yeah like he yeah. was just like a silencer. Like when you start playing, and you're saying people in that community are just like, no, blown one, away. No one, no one could touch him. You know, and and then there was also that comparison of it, it was like the Beatles or the Stones, Natalie McMaster or or Ashley McIsaac, and you know, <laughs> and there are both. They both have incredible. Uh, uh, they're both incredibly talented in their own way. They're different. Thank you. Thank thank God. Like you can't really compare the two because they're different. Just like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, you can't. So um, there was already something there with him happening. Um, and like I said, we would do you know duo gigs and things like that. But then the band was put together, and then we toured for a solid two years without a record, which is completely unheard of today. Like. We, we just toured so then there was this buzz about this live show and uh, we were playing at the ECMAs when they were in St. John's um, yeah, I think in 1995 96 and I remember being in Ashley's room we were going over some things a few of us in the band were there and all of these pieces of paper were being slipped underneath the door and it was it was like one sheet uh summaries of of record contracts <laughs> and we were right that's what we were writing the set list for for our showcase that night and he said emi okay let's write it on the back of that one and that's what like the our set lists were written on the back of these like drafts that's of, crazy of contracts and i didn't know you know i really didn't know what the hell was going on then and that that and alan reed ended up signing him um and that's when I, I met Alan Reed that that uh, that time in St. John's and and uh, I was I so at the CCMAs I was playing with Sunfish and with Ashley and um, Alan looked at me he said what are you into anyway like what what kind of music are you into is it Celtic stuff and it's kind of rock stuff and and I still worked at uh radio land at that point <laughs> and jan arden put out time for mercy and i was like this is a great record you know and had her little martin and everything and this is a great record and i put this big display up of her and and i told alan not knowing that he signed jan i was like <laughs> well <laughs> 
I really like this record by this Jan Arden and, and uh, I was a kid, you know, I was 19. And um, he said, you know, I signed her, right? And I was like, no, I don't even know what that means, really. And, <laughs> um, then he ended up, send, he got Jan to send me, I still have it, a postcard that read, or that reads uh, to Stuart, thanks for all your support. Anybody that plays a little Martin is okay in my, my books. Looking forward to meeting you someday soon, Jan. And I, I was like, this is cool, you know? And, and so then it, it, it just, it kind of went from there. And then, then two years later, we had a record out with Ashley. And then that lasted for like seven and a half years or something. Well, for anyone that is not aware of Ashley McIsaac, so Sleepy Maggie was mm -hmm. the, the big hit. Yep. And again, so that, that we were touring on that song already or that came out after the record contract? Or the record, they got a deal. That I think that I think that we had that demoed by then, and we were playing it in the live show because Mary Jane Lamond, who sings on that uh, track and and wrote that lyric, obviously because it's in Gaelic, um, uh, she was already touring with us at that point. So yeah, we would have we would have had something along the lines of of what that is. So when that that song comes out. And we've got much music here in Canada at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's how most of us found our new music. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel things ramp up from that? Or did it was it a slow thing? Or did it just like, it it's on of, now? It was on. Like, we would... Uh, it was huge. It was huge. It, it Yeah, it was huge. And it was international. Like, yeah, um, that's the thing. In, in, in 1996, uh, I was home for 32 days. And that was because I was on the road with him and we were being released in all of these different countries and going to these festivals. And we had no idea where the hell we were half the time. And, but it was fun. Like we were doing these, we were doing festivals like Roskilde and things where Radiohead is on the same, like they were on after us. We would do, <laughs> we did Telluride Bluegrass Festival once and Johnny Cash was on before us. <laughs> like it was, it was, it was really bizarre. So, and it was all of these different festivals as well. And that's, that goes back to the thing of being a little left of center where you don't sound like anybody else. So it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. I had no idea what I was doing. Like I had, a, a, I had a shitty electric guitar. My rig was awful. I, I really, you know, if I could go back in time, um, I, maybe I would go back and, and adjust some things there, but was, <laughs> but we had fun. We had fun until it wasn't fun anymore, and then it then it didn't become fun, and 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 uh, uh, that thing just stopped, which was fine. I'm so. I'm curious some of the things that might make it not fun anymore. Um, I'm sure there's there's a lot of reasons something can just stop being a thing, but at the same time, like. When things are awesome, it's seven and a half. Seven and a half years is a long time to be yeah. riding a wave for anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, but every wave comes crashing down, right? Usually, yes. And that's what happened. So people think riding a wave is like this the whole time. It's like riding a wave up, 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 and then it just kind of went kaboom, and and um, it was gone. Uh, I did go back a few years ago just to do a couple of duo shows with Ashley and and. Uh, you know, it didn't. It didn't feel right. Didn't work out. Didn't didn't feel the same as when, no. And in in its prime, sort of. Yeah, you know, we were all young. We were all really, really young. So. No, but, but you're just saying being young is just like not everyone gets those experiences out of the gate, sort of thing. And and you mentioned even getting back to the your um, um, comment about you know making sure a band can get into a van to see if they want to do that. When you have a lot of success out of the gate, there's part of that hero story where like it's really good and then it stops and then you kind of need to climb your way back again if you want to do it. Um, usually it's a lot shorter than seven and a half years, mm -hmm. say that. But mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. no, it's just have that success and to be able to learn the ropes that way as well. Because again, you're saying you're writing set lists on the back of uh, record contracts because you don't really see the, the big picture yet. Yeah. So like that's all your part of your education. Yeah, yeah, it totally was. You're you're spot on. You're spot on. And you know, and if we weren't if we weren't in those vans at all those times and um it would have it would have been a lot different. But 
you know, it got to the point where the band was traveling in, in on the bus and Ashley was in a different vehicle. Like, it got to that point as well where, you know, we had to take care of our, ourselves and, and each other. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, sometimes just to make the business work. And it's mm-hmm. one of those things, it's it's kind of, mm-hmm. um, I don't want to say it's bittersweet, but it's one of those things I've seen it happen to bands too, where the mm-hmm. band becomes a business and it just functions the way that it does. I remember seeing uh, years ago a big band that got back together and seeing that they had three buses. And that was the way the band could get along. Yeah. And just thinking they've got the money to do that, but I never thought about that. It's like, how can that band, they've you know, been together for oh, 25, yeah. 30 years. It's like, yep. why can they not get to, oh, because they don't actually want to hang out. They want to play shows exactly, and get paid. Got to pay the mortgage. Yeah, <laughs> and, but. and, you know, I mean, well, during those Ashley years, um, we opened up for Crash Test Dummies for a few months, right? And that's how I ended up meeting all of them. Um and then, so this would have been around 90, around, around 99, uh, moved to New York, and I was walking down the street um, with my then girlfriend and, uh, and, and another friend, and I heard, well, thank you very much, folks, from this little bar, from, and it had this little, this little square at the, at, the, at the door, the window, and I looked in, and there's Brad Roberts, singer of Crash's Dummies, walking off the stage um he got up and sang one song just supporting a friend of his right like this little art thing and walk in it was ten dollars all you can drink and they had these big tubs of of Budweiser (laughs) beer so I grabbed two I grabbed two um two beer and I walked over to Brad and I said would you like one he said thank you what are you doing here (laughs) and I said I moved to New York and he he lived uh up in Harlem at the time and and I, I said, just moved here like like two weeks ago. He and his uh, then business manager, Sandy, were trying to get a hold of me in Toronto. But I didn't have a Toronto <laughs> number anymore. Murray Pulver, my dear friend Murray Pulver, recommended me for the gig. He was leaving to go and pursue his, 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 uh, his production career and recommended me. They couldn't get a hold of me. And then I ended up running into Brad. So that's how I ended up back in the, like, we ran in, literally ran into each other in New York City. and um, Not a small city. No. Not and, a, no, um, no, tons of nooks and crannies in that city. Yeah. And then, so I, I did, I did, you know, some, I did a few tours with them. And uh, then Brad and I started writing. We made a record together in New York at the Magic Shop. Um, uh, uh the record is called Puss in Boots, and that was 2003. So then we toured a bunch, and then it went down to myself and Brad and either his brother and bass or Ellen Reed singing. And So we would go out as a trio, and then that stopped for a while. And then the um, Brad and I started going out as a duo about six years ago and just having fun. You know, we were going out just having fun, playing these small little venues and festivals, um, and then a gig appeared where to have the full band uh, with uh, with Crash Test Dummies with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. So we all went out and did that, and that was about four years ago. And we've been on the road ever well till COVID, but um, that's been a lot of fun. You know, like you're talking about a band reforming, getting back together, and putting it out on the road again. Um, seeing the way that the audience reacts, like the, their nostalgia is overwhelming for some people like they cannot believe that they're actually hearing once they're you know like they're 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 flipping out and um and it's the it's the it's it's fun it's a lot of fun and they're they're there's so much fun to be around and um but we 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 all jump in a van and you know we, we keep on the tour bus thing keeps on coming up Tour buses are really expensive. Fuel is really expensive. Drivers are expensive. Buses to man- maintain them all. They're, it's a massive expense. So if you can do it in a van, if you're able to, do it. Because you come home with more money, you know? And, and that's real. like, that's what we're out there for. You know, we're, we're out there for the enjoyment, but it's a job and you need to, you need to bring home some, some, some cash. For anyone that's not aware, 
<laughs> what is the cost of a month for a bus? Now? Oh, just, I don't just, even know. Just well, even even back back, uh, you know, mid late nineties. A month? Yeah, you're you're up for four weeks. Need a bus. Five hundred bucks a day might be a thousand dollars a day now. Could be fourteen hundred dollars a day now. So you could yeah. be looking at twenty five or thirty thousand dollars a month for a bus. Or a brand new bus could be forty. Yeah. So you know? it's it's one of those things. Like some, and not to be in the spot for that, but it's one of those things where bands don't realize that's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. And the idea, if the label's like, do you guys want a bus? And they go, yeah, let's get a bus. And they go, we're just going to add that to the to tab your here. Account. Yeah. And you're going to pay 90, for, you know, 90 cents on the dollar and recoup that. And, you know, if you're going to need this, that, and the other thing, it's it's not to say it's all upsells on some of that stuff, but you're you're 100% right. And I do agree 100%. Um, you know, if you can do it in a van. If, if you can do it in a van. Keep um, your costs down. And then... But the, 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 the other plus about that, because when you're on a bus, here's the other thing that a lot of people don't realize. If you're on a bus, you're doing night drives. You yeah. don't have a hotel room. You don't have any privacy. You were around 10 or 12 people on that bus, um, you know, 24 hours a day at that point. You're showering in the venues. Not all venues have beautiful showers. Um, you don't have any, you know, alone time to, to watch Netflix and FaceTime to just, with your family, yeah. you know, and like... Um, there are some advantages to hiccup with internet here. It's the wonders of, of live, live studio. See if we, see if we get Stuart back in a second here. Um, we're just talking about, um, touring with a, uh, a, bu a bus versus being in the hotel rooms. And one of the things he did touch on there is the idea of having some alone time or just like having some time to actually unwind a little bit. Because um, a big part of um, being on a bus versus being in a hotel room is like once you're behind closed doors in the hotel room, you can kind of like relax and chill out a little bit. I can imagine if you're on a bus, you never actually have that. Also, the option if you need alone alone time uh, the idea that you could just book another room at that hotel. Because um, there's something to be said on some days off. You know, if you're in a band with a few musicians, the idea where everyone can get their own room, um, that's good too. It's just, can be, can definitely help everybody in their uh, their mental well being. Uh, I'm going to get Stuart back here in a second. Again, just the, the adventure that is live stream uh, podcast here. Um, talking earlier, the idea of having a guitar out or instrument out. Uh, Mike Diesel did post here. Uh, so less, uh, so true. Less steps between working equals less excuses. It's a big thing to make sure things are available at all times when you're uh, when you're trying to learn instrument or craft. See, Stuart is back here. Stuart is back. It's my internet. I'm sure. It's okay. It, we, it's we all good. The, we don't have the fiber out here yet. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it happens. No, it's funny because like it, it's one of those things where it's like, well, it's probably very different how the, the bandwidth actually works. But it's funny because like it doesn't happen when you're watching Netflix or something like that. No. But then like you got a meeting and it's like three minutes into it. You're all. Yeah. And you're like, oh, come serious. Really? Seriously? Or play a song for somebody and nothing. <laughs> yeah. Not fun. Um, I was just I was just going uh, for a second, um, just talking about just the, the hotel rooms mm -hmm. and just for our own mental, you know, mm -hmm. mental capacity. Sometimes mm -hmm. the idea of being able to close that door mm -hmm. and like you're not at work for a second. And I yeah. can imagine on a bus like you're always at work. Yeah. Or you yeah. go into your, your bunk. I remember bringing a neighbor onto a bus thinking, oh, this is going to impress, you know, this couple that lived lived uh, beside us. And Jessica was her name. I was like, Come on. You want to see the bus? She's like. Yeah, okay. And she came on, and I thought, you know, you'd think you had a big slider came out, and brand new bus. And she goes, You all live on here? I went, Yeah. She goes, Where do you sleep? I said, Well, you heard the bunks? He, it's like a coffin. What? <laughs> and and I, just not impressed whatsoever. And, and, uh, and, it, and the, it's like, Yeah, it kind of is like that. It's a, and, or as my friend Dan refers to it, it's a 45 foot fart tube. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah there are there are advantages just to shutting out, out the world and and um and feeling refreshed you know the next morning when you gotta do it all over again yeah just with the, with the whole because i understand some some bands they, they do look and I can go two angles on this right now, but the idea of the extra expenses of hotels, because 
when I'm talking to a band, um, part of me, the whole like part of the, the take me to your leader thing is like, who's in charge of your spreadsheets? Who yeah. deals with Excel in the band? Because that's who I want to talk to because they know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so sometimes they do look at the logistics of it with hotels and everything. And, um, but the idea of having that, that, that space to get away from, uh, uh, and, and as being a tour manager and like the day, day off was always stressful for me because I want to make sure we had stuff that everyone could do. You know, like yeah. one of uh, Canlin, Michigan, one of my favorite places to stay because they've got mini golf, like a walk away. Perfect. There's a few uh, uh, hotels. There's an outdoor pool so we can just use it, even though it's not our, our hotel. Perfect. Um, and my one of my personal favorites, there's an Ikea across the street. Oh, yeah. You can hang out in Ikea all day with a laptop and hang out in living rooms and like a kitchen. Oh, that's and it was, a good idea. Yeah. And it's just like, that's what I would do to spend the day, go doing stuff. Then you can come back like mentally recharged. Yeah. You know, because you get some time away from people. Yeah. Um, I was yeah. just just thinking about that, but I think more bands need to, to hear that. And and I would say more and more bands, um, especially ones that are career minded these days, they are looking at the numbers and go, "We don't need a bus. We can do van and trailer." Yeah, if you and can do it, do it. Keep the crews small. Do it. Um, it's yeah. There are there are because it, it is harder. It's it's harder out there. It's 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 not getting any easier. Um, and then if you can come home with some some extra little change, it's great. <laughs> well, that's the difference. If yeah. someone if someone actually showed the band at the end of the year, this is what you could have mm -hmm. in your bank account. And because mm -hmm. because you're away, you're probably not spending that much if mm -hmm. you are paying attention to your own finances. Mm -hmm. So if someone said you could have X amount of dollars, you could have X amount of dollars in a bus, mm -hmm. but they just sell them on the bus. Oh, yeah. Which is easy. Yeah. And then you can keep up selling people on stuff like yeah. that. Yep. Um, so there's there's uh, so Ashton McIsaac um, that that chapter closes up, um, and then you go into Crash Ted Summies after that. Yep. Um, and then Amanda in in somewhere in there. I'm trying to think because like we we were working together in 2005 ish, 2005 2006 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I because I remember we can start maybe getting into a couple of those stories, but like I remember finishing up a session with you and you you know, getting your darks on to go do a uh, Amanda Marshall concert or mm -hmm. doing those gigs. Mm -hmm. And it just like, and I can tie this back to something you were talking about earlier, but the idea of it's it's a gig, it's a job. Because some musicians are like stressing all day about the gig that night. And it's like, we just finished working. You got your clothes changed. You grab your guitar, grab your amp, and, and you head out and go to the gig. Um, but even going back to the... Um, I love that the, uh, the green eggs and jam, the idea of putting all those hours in on stage. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I don't even think I've seen you play live. I think maybe at like Dundas Chris, Square or something. Chris, but, Chris Cadell. Do you know Chris Cadell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The phenomenal guitar player, virtu virtuoso. <laughs> uh, I've known him for 20 odd years. We geek out all the time. We're friends. He said to me about, about I don't know, maybe two years ago now. Because we just saw him, the other, I saw for my first live music I've seen uh, in, in a very, very long time in Ajax at this club called uh, The Edge. And it was just full on rock and roll. But Chris was playing, amazing band. And But Chris did admit a couple of years ago that he's never seen, we've been friends for over, you know, almost two decades. He's never seen me or heard me play. And, <laughs> but we, I'm like, really? It's really going on, on just words. Damn, Stuart I've plays seen, guitar. I've I've seen you play a lot. And, and, uh, <laughs> So it's kind of an ongoing joke, but now I'm going to be nervous as hell the next, if if he's ever in an audience. Like, <laughs> I better have an on an on an on night or day if he's there. But um, but yeah, but that's the other thing, you know, with, with with musicians. Like, you can you can know somebody for so many years and you never see them again, but then you can just pick it up wherever you left off, you know. And that's 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 a nice nice thing that we all have. Well, I, I joke about that with, with drums because even my, my lovely wife, she heard that I played drums but never saw me play drums for probably close to 10 years. Really? Yep. Yeah. And it was and I, a little bit of a tight end, uh, Brian Mello yeah. um, with yeah. Canadian Oxide. I performed in the video for him. Yeah. And I remember sending that to her. And yeah. she's like, you play drums? I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh. <laughs> well, my wife, uh, I, I first met her uh, in grade nine, because she dated my best friend Adam in high school, and um, about six six or so years ago, I get a Facebook request from from her. Six and a half years ago, I guess, 
a Facebook request. And I said, oh, this is a nice surprise. She was just starting up a business with, with her brother and messaging everybody that went to high school with them. And I happened to be one of them. And she wrote me back and said, did we go to school together? Like, <laughs> and she doesn't remember me at all. But we're married now and happy, so it's 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 okay. But, <laughs> yeah, same 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 same, but different, right? Yeah, it's just, but it's the idea, just like sometimes you just don't see people in that element. Yeah, um, it just totally just flies by, sort of yeah. thing. It's yeah. Like I saw you perform all the time in the uh, in the studio. Yeah, but just as far as live, but just you just run out, play the gig, and then the next morning we're we're back in the studio. Yeah, I yeah. I do want to go back to talk about um with with Gaelic music. Um, I. I can't remember the artist you were you were playing with, but you had to like learn some songs very quickly, and you were showing me some of the some of the tunes you had to play. Yeah. And as a drummer, I was trying to count it, yeah. and had no idea what was going on. And you were, I, and I do remember you like in a in a playful way laughing at me. Yeah. And he's just like, you kind of just need to know this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, like you grew up with it. I think that's what it is. I, I don't think I'd be able to explain to somebody how to chord along to a bunch of fiddle tunes or bagpipe tunes. Like it, it, it is something that, <laughs> because I heard it as a kid, you know, yeah. and, and that it just inherently um, becomes a part of what you do. I mean, I, I honestly, I miss it. I miss playing Celtic music. I haven't played that music in a long time. And, and um, um, you know, ha like I, all of those festivals that we used to go to and, uh, Celtic Colors in Cape Breton or the uh, uh, in Scotland and, and, and like those Celtic connections in, in, in Scotland was amazing but um, that whole community was 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 full of incredible musicians but um, I ended up going down a, a different road you know and, and maybe jazz will be next <laughs> you know, like who, who knows like Pico and I uh, Peter Fusco and I, we've been working, um, like I said earlier, as a, um, a, a, a we have a production team, and we've been making records with uh, this is an artist. She's from New Brunswick, lives in PEI. Her name is Alicia Toner. We just made a second record with her, or that just came out about two months ago. It's called Joan. Um, she's fantastic. Well, we're gonna we've already started talking about making a third. Uh, and then another artist uh, we've been working with, her name is Sadie Campbell. She's from British Columbia, lives in Nashville. I met her at a festival um, about three, four years ago in Halifax. I was there with Brad Roberts. And she was there as a performer. I heard her and said, would love to work with you someday. You know, here's my email and number. We exchanged information. And then um, she wrote me and, and said, uh, I don't know, about... Um, six months later and said I'm going to do a record with Murray Pulver and she wrote this really nice email and I thought well, this is you know I love Murray with all of my heart Are you kidding have a great time and he's the best and um, this past January she messaged again and said do you still feel like would you be up for collaborating so yeah okay so she sent a couple of songs and one I really really liked and I sent it on to Pico and then within a few days, we sent her this whole track back. You know, we basically just asked her for the acoustic guitar and her vocal, and we worked with with pretty much the vocal. And um, then before we knew it, we had an EP ready to go that was released a few weeks ago. Uh, the first single was called Fade, and it's this EP called Dark Room. There's videos for everything, and it's just like this whole different. Um, I guess I don't know if it's a sur survival instinct or if it's just it naturally happened and and um, I'm so happy it did because it, well if it didn't uh, you know I'd probably just be sitting here missing the road and um, feeling sorry for myself or something but we we kept on working and working and working and we had this really great uh, system down now as to how to record and get everything done so it's. Yeah. I've, I've had I've had you for over an hour now. You got a little bit more time. Uh, wow. Yeah. It, I told <laughs> you it goes that. quick. It goes really quick. Um, but on on the topic mm -hmm. um, of, of recording and production teams, um, the heartbroken. Yeah. Um, that's we made, we made two records. And um, we yeah, it's not happening right now. No, but even going back to that, the idea yeah. of like. When I saw who was all in that band, yeah, 
I was like, this is a band of friends. Yeah. To get well, together and make some music. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, friends and, and that becomes family. And, and um, I mean, Pico, I still play with, like, I have this thing with Pico, but Pico and Blake are also in Matthew Good's band, you know? Um, like, I met, I met Pico when I was 12 years old. He was 14. And we go back that far, you know? And my band signature opened up for his band called Beaumont um, uh, multiple times. And my first bar gig ever at 12, Pico was there. And, um, and Pico and Blake have been playing together for over 25 years in different configurations, you know, with Tim Bobaconti and a whole, they've done multiple yeah, records. Drummer, bass player duo. Exactly. Team, you know? yeah. Exactly. Um, so it's been, yeah, uh, you, you just end, you, you, you become comfortable uh, not only performing with somebody on a stage, but you become, or being in a van or in a dressing room or in a bus, whatever. Um, but then you become really comfortable with them in a recording studio where you get to play off each other and things start happening quickly because they know your next instinct. Or if you're in a live situation, if, if somebody is just kind of having an off night, which which happens to all of us. The best of us. The best yeah. of us. And um, that's when, you know, when people have your back, they're, you know, that's when Blake will kind of step it up a little bit and <laughs> cover up for for my lackluster playing. <laughs> <laughs> like, nothing's working. Uh, so it, it's it's nice to have that, that support. And that's where, you know, like with the Heartbroken, when we would walk into... Um, the CCMAs and things like that. That goes back to earlier. Felt like a gang. You know, you felt like you, you have support with you. And that's a it's a great feeling. It really is. Yeah. I, I just I I was curious about that because session players. Mm -hmm. The idea are usually playing other people's music. You learn the songs and you come in, you you fill that role, but the idea of crossing that line and going let's create our own songs and our own music mm -hmm. and are we doing that collectively or is there a lead songwriter or like how does how does that the dynamic and chemistry work we all sat down at first um basically with the everybody had an acoustic guitar everybody would show up with a bottle or two of wine <laughs> really um and you know the, the 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 name of the band was fitting because it was it was kind of, it was kind of the lyrics were kind of depressing a lot of the times, and it was about heartbreak and all of that stuff and loss. Um, but we rolled with it, you know. We 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 weren't shy and, and sharing any of that stuff. So, um, but that's how it started. Where we'd start around a table, um, an island in the kitchen, and then we would move it to Johnny McLeod's space off McCall, and go in there hash stuff out, figure out different vibes, record all of those sessions, go back, listen, reassess. Um, uh, the, the best thing that we could have done is when we started uh, a residency at the Dakota and or actually the three speed is where we had our first we had our first um, our first residency the, 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 the week that that bar opened up. Um, our friend Judd let us let us play there like every Tuesday or something, and having those weekly shows, it really it really helps you form all of those songs and get all of the kinks out of there, and that's important. I mean, we do that with uh, with the Do Goods with Ron Hawkins. We did um, a couple of residencies like at Cherry Colas and again at the Dakota. Those are the most fun. You get to just play and um, test test it out, you know? Yeah, is rehearsal. Is working for an audience? Yeah, rehearsal is one thing, but getting up on stage and actually playing it, um, yeah. that's when you know it works. Yeah, you know, and oh, nobody liked that song. And, <laughs> but that's but that's how you know. Like, oh, that's that too is how you know. Or that's too slow and boring, or this is too ethereal, or, you know, you... you you get to you, you need to read your audience and 
I played my first show with Jason McCoy, who's a country artist. I played with him last weekend, or the weekend before last. And, uh, you know, set list, I, don't, I think it was my third time playing with him. And by song number three, He's he's yelling out other songs that I'm like I don't know this. It's like Bo, it's an A. Don't worry. And and like <laughs> okay, go. And and I love that. Like I I do love that kind of. It keeps you on your toes. And he probably added another five songs to the set at least that night. Added to it. My dad used to um, tell me what song he was going to start with and what song he was going to end with. That's it. So because it keep you on your toes, you gotta. You either know it or you don't, and then you learn to, to back off a little bit and not be loud and proud. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just yeah. No, I, I I love seeing bands, you know, big and and small. When you see them like start, well, I guess more small yeah. than they get big, but they start do forty or fifty shows, and then you talk about that that kind of gang mindset and like that confidence on stage. And it's like when you get to see the the contrast between the two. Because not not to pick on some bands, I know this is dear bands, but not to pick on some bands. But when they play like one big gig every you know every three months, every four months, mm -hmm. and it's like you don't really get that good that way. It's like go yeah. get in the van, go go play twenty shows in twenty five days, and yeah. see how much better you get. Those three rehearsals a week, not the same. And try and represent the record best you can. That you spend all yeah. that money and time and recording, and all the little nuances and. Um, because there are, you know, like we'll spend how much time would you spend on a snare drum sometimes? Like you just got, oh, no, it's not right. It's not right. Why not? <laughs> why not make it as, as close to the recording as possible and, and let the song develop in a live situation? Because that happens a lot where, you know, you record a record, you go to tour it, you rehearse it. Um, sounds like the record. Six months later, you're playing and you've been going steady. And then it's like, wow, sounds nothing like the recording anymore. But at least you've all it, it all if if and when it happens naturally, then it, then it then it's great. The audience isn't going to complain. It, it can take on another life. Yeah. Um, so just one. Just, I got yeah. thinking about it. Uh, Dad Doyle was part of uh, yeah, Heartbroken. Heartbroken. So I want to make sure. Um, also part of the group Shay. Yep. Was that before or after? The Heartbroken actually came out of Shay. Okay, because I you you played in in. I played in Shea. Shea as well. Yeah, and so did Pico and so did Blake. Because that, the the three female fronted, like that was, yeah. that was a super group. Yeah. As far as everyone that was, that yeah. was being in there. I know that they hated that name. I, ah, but the, I, was super group or Shea? Well, that title, no, super group. Well, we can say that here. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, the idea of that group getting together and playing shows, mm -hmm. what was that like touring? That was, I mean... It didn't tour a lot, but the one tour that we did, um, unfortunately, it wasn't a full band. It was it was Davenant, Kim Stockwood, Tara McLean, and myself and Blake Manning. And I was just on acoustic guitar, mm. and um, Blake had like a djembe and a snare, and maybe a tiny little kick drum. I can't really remember, but we opened up for Willie Nelson across Canada, and I had a friend that told me. You'll meet Willie at the very beginning, and then you won't talk to him until the end of the tour, and then you might get a picture with him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we golfed with him twice. Um, we were on his bus, you know, hanging out there. And uh, But that was one of the most memorable tours that I've ever ever been on in, in, in my life. And then B. Spears, uh, who was Willie's bass, bass player for like 46 years or something, who unfortunately died just a few years ago, um, he would come into our dressing room every single night and sneak a beer, you know. What do you got going on? I was like, hey, we'll <laughs> he'd have a beer, and I don't know if he was allowed, but he'd he'd come over and tell us hilarious stories. And uh, uh, he said, "Man, by the by, like show number three, he said you really need a bass guitar on that that third song or second song, whatever it was, second or third song." And all of a sudden. B Spears from Willie Nelson's band is like on there with us. And so then that happened. And then Mickey, uh, who is um, uh, uh, Willie's harmonica player for like the last 40 years or something, 
the newest member of the band. <laughs> he's like, I'd love to play harmonica on that song. So now it's like, well, if he's going to play harmonica on that song, why don't I just stay up here and, and we'll play bass? So then we have, I was like, okay, who else is going to come up, you know? But it was... It was a neat thing. And then B. Spears, he would stand on this little riser every single night. And um, and I said to him one day, I said, I said, he's, it's, you know, because he would come down on the floor with us. Nobody would go on the risers. The risers were behind us. So we were just on the main deck. And B. comes came down and, and uh, I said, you look good down here, man. You don't need to be on that riser. You need to. So that night, Willie looked back at B and went, what are you doing here? Because he's usually about <laughs> three or four feet back and on a little, you know, two-foot riser. What are you doing back here? And he said, Stuart told me to stand down here. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. So, but that was a, that was an incredible experience. And out of that did come the heartbroken. Um, and, uh, and Kevin Fox is actually responsible for putting, putting that band together. So... He he actually he he deserves all the credit for that one. Ken Fox, uh, cellist, multi instrumentalist. Yep. Yep. Um, I th I think it was around uh, that time we were working together. But I remember seeing um, Chantelle Kravyazuk. Um, he was playing with her, uh, so she's playing piano and singing, and Kevin's playing cello and singing backgrounds. And oh, Stuart's froze again. Um, but anyway, it, Kevin was playing cello and singing backgrounds and Chantel was singing and playing piano. Uh, and remember just thinking the amount of mental gymnastics going on right now was blowing my mind. Cause it's one thing to be having recorded Kevin several times and his pitch and his time and everything um, just phenomenal. But the idea of being able to, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I got to you here. One second. I was just telling the story about how I remember seeing uh, Kevin say, uh, playing cello and singing and Chantel yeah. playing and yeah. singing and, and just being like, what is going on right now? Cause I can't even stand and play guitar. Like I don't have, I don't have the, the ability to do that. I think you froze again. Uh, I don't have the ability to even stand and play guitar and watching those two play two instruments at the same time, be it vocal and the instrument they're doing. Um, it was, it was blowing my mind with that, with the, the amount of, uh, talent there because um, some things you can practice and there's other things where i'm like i think you just kind of have to know this one um in order to do this so i really got it you're back this problem it's My all good God, it's happening? all good this makes it exciting <laughs> again the thing we talked about earlier being on stage and you just kind of like you roll with it you gotta go um, with it Anyways, if you i'll say it third time but just watching the two of them both sing and play their instrument at the same time was just like that's yeah. a whole other league where oh, like, yeah. i Ah. yeah kevin's amazing yeah just and, and and yeah and just working on some of the rock stuff too because mm -hmm. like i've i'm sure you've worked with the musicians as well that can play but mm -hmm. they can't like hear and then hear what they would add to it and then play it and just with kevin it was easy it's like here's the song we need to kind of feel like this and he just starts putting these lines together and mm -hmm. build these chords and stuff mm -hmm. i'm like oh this is awesome and then you have mm -hmm. some other musicians that don't get it mm -hmm. and they're like what well, what do i play like what you think sounds good? Yeah, I don't well, know how I mean, to explain but, but it. That's that, uh, that's I think that's just natural ability. Yeah, and, and being able to recognize, um, or being influenced by other types of music, right? That's why it's important to listen to jazz or or as much music as you can, <laughs> because there there are going to be like I even know with the Sadie Campbell stuff. I'm like I've never used those chords before, and and I know it's because of just li being. You know, listening to different types of music. You need to. You need to do that. That's the only way that you're going to come up with really any original ideas. You got to borrow it from everybody else. That's that's how you branch out. Um, one more thing I wanted to say: when you get it, was it an email or a text? Hey, we might be opening for Willie Nelson. Do you remember that? Because uh, again, we, things fall through all the time, and we get fed stuff. Or like, okay, this might happen, but yeah, I mean, at the first one was. Um, yeah, I remember getting an email and it was either going to be, actually it was, uh, we don't know if you're going to do it or not. <laughs> Plant right? the seed. Right. Because I think Kevin was out with Chantel. So it was either going to be myself or Kevin and Kevin was the musical director for Shay. And so naturally, you know, and he's a strong singer. I'm not. 
Um, and uh, but that was yeah, that was the first email. Like we're gonna go in the road, but you're not gonna be able to go. I was like, okay. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But, um, yeah. That, but that that was that was one of the best experiences I've ever had. It was just. I can. I I bet we could fill an hour and a half easy mm-hmm. with uh, with some of those stories. Well, so let's I think do it again. I think there's there's a couple stories um, I remember off to the side, um, but yeah, no, definitely we could do a, a follow up, um, talking about some of the some of the more tour stories because people love the tour stories and especially even people like people in bands like fans of music they just they like to know what actually goes on because some of it you can't make it up, yeah. you can't make up some of the stuff that happens. Yeah, yeah, so. it's 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 impossible and um, and. You, <laughs> I think that's that's kind of what keeps it going. Like I remember, there was an artist I played with, and their management came out with this five-page uh, contract, an NDA that you're not allowed to um, you're not allowed to talk about this person off stage or at home. I'm like, this is what I do. I love telling <laughs> stories. And one person in the band signed it, and the other two didn't. Um, I'm like you know. No, we're and just kind of refused. No, like we didn't get in trouble for it or anything. <laughs> it was a suggestion. There was like, will you sign this? No, I will not sign this. I'm going to tell stories. Okay, I'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, they tried. Well, you can't can't harm from trying, I guess. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. We we should definitely uh, connect on this and and chat chat about bit more about um, some of the touring stories. Um. Yeah. Good place to wrap things up. We're an hour and a half in. Told you the time just melts away. Um. I wanted to throw one more thing out there. I know I keep saying that. Um. One of the the pieces of advice um you gave for guitarists early on. Wonder if it still applies. Play from the hip. Play from the hip. Yeah. So play. You said a lot of these guitar players had their guitar in front of them. And you're just like you need to just turn it off to the side and play from I the said hip. That? You did. You just like play from the hip. Like you got to this like play. People are standing up. This guitar is in front. Of, it's funny because the the uh, the picture for the thumbnail. I see that. And I'm just like, there's Stuart Cameron playing from the hip. I I don't remember saying you that. You did. But, you uh, did say that. I remember you went on a thing about how the strap should look with guitar players. Like it, you know, it just needs to look a certain way. <laughs> like, might have been might have been late night studio session. Yeah. I mean, I thought my, it was funny. My my advice now would just make sure all of your gear works, and <laughs> you know, always have a, always have at least two extra sets of strings with you, and guitar picks, and cables, and yeah, make sure your shit as, works. As you get older, it's a little bit more objective, a little more technical. Oh, just yeah. make sure your stuff works. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Sean oh, Ball from from Wide Mouth Mason the other day, he had this something on uh, Instagram where he was showing his pedal board. And all I could think about was like 20 years ago where he would have four or five different pedals uh, across the across a stage being dragged around by his curly guitar cable going, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, like the signal's going to be lost. In it. They're a three piece band. There, so. There's another musician. Um, I remember watching uh, them playing Mike Bullard, a little yeah. bit of throwback and just watching him sing and play guitar. I was yeah, like, I amazing. don't get it. I don't get fantastic. it at all. Oh, there's lots of those guys, too. Yeah. Joey Landreth. I mean, you listen to Joey Might. play. Might need a warm introduction if you can. Okay. Some of those players. Yeah, yeah. Love to be able to chat with them about their their starts. Um, again, good place to probably wrap things up. Anything else you'd like to mention before we sign off? Um, yeah, we're gonna make another Do Good Assassins record, and the last record that we made was on a two four six Tascam four track machine. <laughs> yeah, that record's called two four six. It sounds great. Uh, Alicia Toner, her record. Um, Sadie Campbell single was released two weeks ago, and that rec- that EP is coming out um, on August the twenty seventh. Excellent. And where can everyone find you online? Stu's Brews. S T U S B R U S. I had a fantasy one time to that I wanted to own a bar, um, and uh, that's where Stu's Brews came from. So, who knows? Maybe someday it'll happen. It might be in the backyard. <laughs> very exclusive yeah you're invited so things thank you things we learn from downtown yeah. toronto yeah exclusive bars they just have to be in the know 
know where Stu's Bruise is. Um, as far as the details where to find you uh, online and some of the, the acts and bands you played with, um, I'll put those in the details below. If you're watching the replay on YouTube, if you're watching the replay on YouTube, remember to like, subscribe, and comment. That does help us. Um, thanks again to everybody for tuning in in the chat and taking part. Uh, many of the questions we did not get to, we will go through after. Reply my to them. My cousin Callum did say hello, so I'll I have to say hi back to my cousin did, Callum. Did see Callum yeah. um, on, on YouTube there. Um, thanks again, everybody. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Langford. This has been Dear Bands Live, and thanks again to our guest today, Stuart Cameron. Thanks, Mike. All right, that's our time today. Talk to you later. See ya. <laughs>